Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. This week is Thanksgiving in the U.S. Happy Thanksgiving to all. And this year I'm thankful for my sponsors, Goliath Technologies and Liquidware. Cheesy, I know, but I try to change the tagline every once in a while, so give me a break. If you enjoy the show each week, you have them to thank. And now for some news. It was announced this week that Microsoft have acquired FS Logix. If you follow my podcast, you'll have heard me talk about FS Logix on multiple occasions for new releases and also the addition of their Cloud Cache Drive product several months ago. FS Logix have several products, including app masking, profile containers, Cloud Cache Drive, and their Office 365 container. Based on Brad Anderson's announcement post, he titled it Microsoft Acquires FS Logix to Enhance the Office 365 Virtualization Experience. Microsoft also previously posted an article highlighting FS Logix as the solution for roaming Office 365 years before this acquisition. When FS Logix launched their Office 365 product originally, it was the only product that solved all of the challenges of roaming Office 365. Liquidware, Citrix, and Avanti have been doing a good job of bridging that gap and now customers have options. Clearly, with Microsoft now acquiring FS Logix, soon Office 365 customers could have a Microsoft delivered solution, which is awesome. In the article, Brad also highlights Windows Virtual Desktop, Microsoft's Azure-only Windows 10 multi-user VDI offering. I posted a blog post with Trent Tai about this over a month ago, if you want to check that out. And while the details aren't fully clear right now on how the product will be integrated and offered to existing customers, I hope that it won't just be limited to those using Windows Virtual Desktop. I know my buddy Steve Greenberg's been pretty adamant on Twitter that he feels that's not going to be the case, that they're not going to chop off their own legs by limiting it only to Azure Windows Virtual Desktop customers, and I hope that's true. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Kevin Goodman, Randy Cook, Brad Rowland, Gabe Knuth, Jim Moyle, Dr. Benny Trish, and everyone at FS Logix. They've been a huge support to the whole community and me personally. They have helped promote this podcast through their site and mailers. They have sponsored my site, RoryMon.com, for over a year. And also, in my opinion, they've been the absolute best Citrix user group sponsor. You know, CEO Kevin Goodman himself has been kind enough to come to multiple events in Phoenix over the years. And each time he has come, he's prepared different sessions. So he offers to do a session on FS Logix if the majority of people just want to hear about FS Logix or give a short five minute version about FS Logix and then use the rest of the time to talk about something else. In Phoenix, he did a great session on containers, not FS Logix containers, but like Docker containers and container technology in general. When I was in Kansas, he did a great session on you know, the business of Citrix and where he sees things going. I guess being a CEO, he's a much more big picture thinker than I am, and I find it really inspirational to hear him talk about these kind of big picture things that I just couldn't fathom on my own. But once again, congratulations to everybody at FS Logix. I can't wait to see what Microsoft do with the product. I'm sure it's going to continue to be awesome. Sticking with Microsoft, Microsoft have announced they have turned on the ability to log into Windows using FIDO2 compatible devices, or I guess FIDO2. If you'd like to use it for yourself, you'll need to update to Windows 10 October update. To get started, go to the Microsoft account page on Microsoft Edge and sign in as you normally would. Navigate through Select Security, More Security Options, and under Windows Hello and Security Keys, you'll see instructions for setting up a security key. Then next time you sign in, you can either click More Options, use a security key or type in your username, and at that point you'll be asked to use a security key to sign in. These FIDO2 types of devices are becoming very popular, and while I do think this is cool, I kind of wish there was a secure solution to just sign in using my phone. I like how Okta Verify works. I prefer that to Microsoft's Authenticator app. It would be cool to use my phone to log in using a button and then get a Verify or Approve response. 
I'm not a security expert by any means, and I'm sure that has shortcomings, but I'm also sure that this kind of solution also has some security holes. Either way, the less times I have to put in a password, the happier I am. So good job on getting this out there, I guess. On the topic of Microsoft and authentication, Office 365 and Azure MFS users were locked out earlier this week as Microsoft's MFA service took a dump. On Twitter, Microsoft MVP Brian Reed took the chance to emphasize the importance of setting up a break glass account to ensure you don't get locked out in the future if this happens again. By default, Azure Global Admin accounts have MFA enabled now, so definitely get out on this if you haven't already. This week, Ars Technica reported on some of the details of Intel's 9th generation i9 processors, which Intel state is coming with a hefty price tag of $580. Built on the Coffee Lake architecture, the 99,000K features 8 cores, 16 threads, and 60 megabytes of L3 cache. Turbo performance grows up to 5 gigahertz. Intel has also added a feature called the Solder Thermal Interface Material, or STEM, a layer of metal on the top of the actual silicone chip that conducts heat away. This, the theory goes, conducts heat better than the thermal glue that Intel used on previous processors under the metal heat spreader that covers and protects the chips. Looking at most of the spec other than the L3 cache and the turbo clock speed, not a whole lot has had major changes. The base clock speed is the same as older processors. It's using the Coffee Lake architecture and many of the other specs remain unchanged. But the skinny is changes to resource man management that should make it more powerful overall. Benchmark testing shows some decent gains, but as stated in the Ars Technica article, some of the speeds will only ever really be utilized through synthetic testing and is overkill for users. At the price tag right now, it may only make sense for hardcore gamers or machines required for very intensive processing work. An interesting tidbit, during the announcement, in the footer of one of the slides, Intel stated with the release of the 9th generation CPUs, hardware protection for the L1 terminal fault and Meltdown V3 vulnerabilities has been added. But the other vulnerabilities still require software and microcode protection from what I understand. And while on the topic, did someone say new Meltdown Inspector variants? Unfortunately, yes. Virtualinfrastructure.it have reported seven new attacks have been discovered with two new variants of Meltdown and five new variants of Spectre. At the time of this episode, patches have not been released as of yet. And as stated, even with the new CPUs, it looks like we'll continue to need software and microcode protection for some of the variants. Citrix's David Cottingham, Amazon AWS have announced a BYOL automation option allowing you to bring your Windows 7 and Windows 10 desktop operating systems to Amazon workspaces and save money with bring your own license. This helps you recognize significant cost savings because you get a discount of $4 per workspace per month which is a saving of up to 16% when you bring your existing Windows licenses to workspaces. There's a pretty easy three-step process to bring your Windows desktop OS to workspaces. I won't go through it on the podcast, but I'll link with this episode, which is episode 47 on 5bytespodcast.com. Just check under reference links or in the YouTube description. Sticking with Amazon AWS, they also announced a self-service management feature to help reduce help desk load to allow users to reboot, rebuild, change build types, increase volume size, and change the running mode of their workspaces directly. This week, Google launched a beta of Containered on Container Optimized OS for Kubernetes Engine 1.11. Containered is an industry standard container runtime and Docker's core runtime component. Kubernetes, which has been growing massively in popularity over the last 18 months, also plays a role. As it's a beta, Google are encouraging developers to try it out for themselves and provide feedback. They've provided a short how-to guide on their Google Cloud blog. Engadget reports that Microsoft have opened the doors for native ARM apps on Windows 10. Visual Studio 15.9 has been released, which gives developers the tools they need to build ARM64 apps. Devs can publish these apps onto the Microsoft Store. It will be very interesting to see what this could mean a few years from now. 
Obviously, with the original line of Surface devices and Windows 8, ARM wasn't received very well, but mostly due to the lack of apps. ARM provides great savings on resource utilization, so I could see how it could be compelling in the future and worth developing toward, so maybe this will be the incentive for devs to embrace it. And this next one could be a tip in fairness, but if you want to manually check your PC and see if its apps are compatible for Windows 10, you could do that using a command line. The parameters are auto upgrade, quiet, no reboot, compact sca scan only using the Windows 10 setup. I feel like I tweeted about this two or three years ago. I remember being on a webinar with Michael Nihas and he said that that information was publicly available. So at the time I went ahead and tweeted it, but it was shared by Deploy Jeremy this week on Twitter, which reminded me about it. So I figured it might come in useful to somebody doing a Windows 10 migration today. At the end of last week, the Windows Server 2019 container images were released. Server 2019 is now also available for download as an ISO on your Visual Studio subscription or formerly known as MSDN. And now for this week's hot jobs. Round Tower Tech are hiring for multiple positions throughout the United States. Many are listed as open location within the United States and some are based in Cincinnati and others in Tampa. They are looking for everything from project managers to engineers to consultants to architects. I'm sure it's a great place to work as I have met a few folks who work there at conferences and know some online who are really sharp that work there. If the talent they already have is any indication, you'll learn a lot in this gig. Check out roundtower.com slash career for more. And now for this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. I've got two short tips again this week. First, my buddy Paul Wynn Stanley shared a great free 30-page paper on managing Windows 10 with SCCM. Paul is a Microsoft MVP and is one of my go-to guys when I have questions about SCCM design or Intune. If you don't already, follow him on Twitter. He kicks ass. And another tip this week. So it's another week and another great article on ICTR. This time by Elto Van Gulik on how to maximize server scalability with Citrix policy templates. The policy templates are provided by Citrix. You'll have access to them already, but you likely don't realize the full impact of using them. This article goes through with metrics the impact of each template. For example, the impact of say using high server scalability template instead of the very high definition user experience policy template. You know, you might assume that giving a user a very high definition experience is going to lead to some performance degradation. Well, this article goes through in detail, showing you exactly the metrics on that. As usual, I try not to give away people's work on this show and just encourage you to check this out for yourself. It's a great opportunity to fine tune your own Citrix farms. And that's at ICT-R.com, which I will link with this episode, which again is episode 47. And by the way, on last week's episode, I said that was episode 47. So my bad on that. I'll have to fix that. And like I said at the top of this week's episode, if you're in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving. If you're not in the U.S., hey, happy Thanksgiving anyway. Thanks so much for listening.